After choosing empowerment over dread, I began searching for meaningful and effective solutions to put into practice in my own life. Progressive Hedonist is a podcast to share the ways we can take on climate change through food and joy. On days when this seems completely impossible, this podcast is a reminder that each of us can make an impact. I'm Dana Cowan. Join me in conversations with thought leaders like Alice Waters, Andrew Zimmern, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, and more. We can learn together what is possible. You can listen anywhere podcasts can be found and join the conversation on Instagram at progressive underscore hedonist. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Please come and join me back at your seats. We're going to kick off our live panel discussion. Uh, just as a reminder, we're going to be recording this as part of the, the Farm Report podcast. So, And we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. So if you haven't already, there's still time. You can just drop off your, your Q&A, your questions at registration, and we'll, we'll try and get to those. Um, but I am so excited. For me, this is the main event of the evening. We have such a great panel. Um, and so I'd love to invite up um, Michelle Hughes, who's the co-executive director of the National Young Farmers Coalition, you met earlier, and member of the USDA Equity Commission. We have uh, Chris Nickel, community organizer and farmer co-founder of Finca Soremos. And Leah Penniman, black Creole farmer, mother, soil nerd, author, and food justice activist from Soul Fire Farm. Wow, okay. So, just want to kick this off just as a, you know, a way of introduction and the work that y'all do. Um, so, can you tell us, I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to answer this question, but how or why did you get into the work that you're doing right now, whether that's community organizing, farming, policy work? Um, tell us a little bit about your, your story there. Yeah, go for it. Um, thanks, Lee. Um, I, so I came to Young Farmers. Um, we have lots and lots of fellows now. Some of you might be familiar with our like 100 Land Advocacy Fellowship that we had running for the, a couple of years ago. Um, when I started at Young Farmers, we were 12 staff, we're now 50 folks about. Um, and I was Young Farmers' first fellow. I was still farming at the time, so I was working on a hog farm in Pennsylvania. And I met the coalition um, at a PASA conference, which is a sustainable agriculture conference that takes place in Pennsylvania annually. Um, so I met the coalition. I had no idea that the things that I was struggling with were so common. Um, with other farmers. I didn't work with any other farmers my age at the time. Most of them were like much older than me. Um, so that's kind of how I got into this work. Um, I had no idea that when I started as a fellow at Young Farmers that I would eventually become executive director of the organization. So, <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> so I've served in a lot of different roles at the coalition um, and kind of just fell in love with policy. I started actually here in the Hudson Valley. We used to have an office in Hudson. We started here. So when I started, I was here um, organizing roundtables ahead of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, with maybe some folks in this room or some folks that you know um, with chapters here. Um, and I kind of just fell in love with policy. The Farm Bill came out and I decided to sort of follow it and how like money moved through the food and ag system. So um, I've done all sorts of things, more things than I could probably remember to name right now since then. Um, and it's kind of just brought me here. And I'm really grateful to be in this space and to have the power that I do today. So... That's my story. Thank you. Chris, can you share? Yeah. Um, I come from central West Virginia. Um, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I grew up all around farms, so I was no stranger to that life. And I always thought that my spouse, Brenda, and I would end up doing this work at some point in our lives. Um, 
During the pandemic, I was working in state government with my state senator. Um, I got into that work as a community organizer for about a decade in, in northern Manhattan and um, got really burnt out doing this kind of direct service work, uh, rent relief clinics, food pantries, um, really helping a under-resourced community try and make it through this devastating public health disaster. And was thinking about sort of what was next, wanted to continue organizing in the community, um, and food sort of rose to the top. Um, my spouse, Brenda, and I believe that food is a really powerful medium for doing community organizing. And so we founded Finca Seremos, which means we will be farm. This is our first year growing. We started our season with about 30 CSA members and we ended with 60, um, which is pretty exciting for a little farm. Yeah. Um, and our mission is to organize through food um, and to make connections where there might not otherwise have been connections. And I think we can talk more about it, um, but I think there's deep connections between uh, a more expansive definition of regenerative agriculture and the power that food has to connect us. Let's together. definitely talk more about it. Yeah. I'm gonna put it in that for net, pin in that for now, but yeah. yeah, thank you. Leah. First of all, thanks so much for having me. I grew up in a rural town in central Massachusetts. I didn't find farming until I was a teenager totally fell in love, but was skeptical about whether it could have an enduring place in life for all kinds of practical reasons. My commitment to racial equity and seeing that black organizers were focused on things like education systems and gun violence. And so that's where I assumed I belonged, but also just the practicalities of, uh, you know, finance and resource and income and became a public school teacher, was a public school teacher for 17 years. And during that time, uh, my spouse and I had our two young ones, uh, Emma and Ashima, who are now in college, and we're living in the south end of Albany, New York, which is a neighborhood under food apartheid. And it was a struggle to get vegetables. We, there was a McDonald's, there was a liquor store, and there was no you know, supermarket or bus to get to the supermarket, no available community garden plots or farmer's markets. And so when our neighbors found out that both of us had farming experience, they started this gentle peer pressure to revive the farm dream and create a farm that would feed the South End. And it tickled something in us. And, you know, we ended up wetting ourselves to this kind of hard scrabble mountainside in Grafton, New York. And with all of the naivete and ambition of our mid-20s, you know, <laughs> built from scratch a farmstead, on you know, vacant land, there was no septic or electric or buildings or soil for that matter. Uh, and four years after starting you know, Open Soul Fire Farm in 2010, and the first program that we did was low and no cost doorstep delivery on a sliding scale model to the south end of Albany. That's our longest running program. And over time realized that there was just so much more need around food and land justice and culturally sensitive farmer education, organizing, and you know, we, we'd had no idea that farming, you know, I'm introverted and I like being by myself in the woods and like <laughs> this whole thing, like that was not anywhere in our schema of what is possible for farming. And so it's been just a you know, delightful surprise after another um, being connected to you all and being connected to this important work over the years. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. And kind of, um, you know, we just watched this film together, Common Ground, and really talks a lot about regenerative ag as being this, this solution to the climate chaos that we're all dealing with. And um, Lee, you gave a beautiful definition of regenerative ag in the film. And I want to give um, Michelle and Chris a chance to kind of give their definition of or how they're thinking about regenerative ag. And of course, if you want to also weigh back in, you're more than welcome. Um, but yeah, I thought that might be a good, good place to start our conversation here. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, so I brought this um, young farmers survey that some of you might be familiar with. It's called Building a Future with Farmers. So we do a survey of young farmers every five years at the coalition alongside the Census of Agriculture. This survey was the most respondents we've ever gotten. Um, young farmers doesn't have a super long history, so we've only done this a few times. Um, but we had over 10,000 respondents to this survey. Um, and I want to be true to the work that we do and tell you that in the survey report, um, regenerative agriculture, by definition, at young farmers is described as 
um, a practice that builds healthy soil, healthy ecosystems, and supports climate resilient farms and communities that they feed and service, and on top of those things, and through those things, tries its best to address the inequities that exist within the agriculture sector. Um, and I, I think that's like a broad general definition that we hope encompasses the 86% of respondents who say that they identify their practices as regenerative. Um, but I think for us, it's not only just like a thing and like something that we can like tangibly define, but also is at the heart of our work. Almost the same percentage of those folks, I think it's like 83 or something, identified going into farming, like one of the primary reasons for farming or their operation existing in the first place is regenerative agriculture or conservation. Um, and so it's like a practice, but also is very much at the heart of all the work that many of young farmers do in our community. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I want to build on the last word that you just said, which is community. I think um, there's a way to think about regenerative agriculture that I think before or after Leah's excellent definition in the film, they kind of tried to zero in on and say like, oh, well, it's no-till and cover crops. And, and sure, I think some of these practices are important. Um, we can talk about tillage a little bit later. I know it's such a hot button topic. <laughs> um, but I think there's a way that we need to be careful that regenerative doesn't become this kind of greenwashing term that loses a lot of value and purchase in the ways that we can advocate for healthier practices. Um, and I think one of the ways that we can do that is by expanding the way that we think about the word regenerative. And to build on your point about community, to me, regenerative agriculture is about, yes, soil health practices, but also, again, sort of using food as a way to organize deeper relations to community. Um, and I think in doing so, we can regenerate our communities. Um, we're living in a time of significant social isolation and the psychological pressures that that brings to bear on all of us um, sort of find their outlet in all of these horrible things that happen in the country, all these mass shootings, et cetera. Um, and if we're working to regenerate our communities, we're fighting against that actively. Um, and if we're working hand in hand with the soil to do that, um, it's a beautiful thing and it's also more difficult to co-opt that in a kind of greenwashing slogan because um, it's the work, capital T, capital W. And I think it's, it makes it more resistant to the kinds of efforts to sloganize it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for, for saying that. Leah, did you have anything you wanted to add? Or? I just want to build on what you said because I think the co-opting is, is such an important thing to pay attention to. And I remember working at Many Hands Organic Farm in Massachusetts back in the 90s when uh, organic was taken away from the grassroots organizations that were certifying it by the federal government and the lawsuits that uh, Jack Kittredge was party to to try to stop that process. And of the many, many things that were lost in the co-opting of organic by the federal government, I remember the particular fight around chickens and like the definition of pasture and outdoors. Um, <laughs> because the way that we raised our chickens on that farm, they truly lived these natural lives and they were integrated into the ecosystem, you know, like a lot of the images that you see here. And the idea that you could have, you know, windows that open and the chickens go out for a minute and then they come back in or you just have open space and they're on a floor like counting. I, I remember so many sleepless nights where Jack was just, you know, beside himself like this is not how you treat animals, this is not how you treat the earth and consumers won't understand. And I worry about the checklisty definition of regenerative because it's very easy for it to go that route of corporatizing and, and even this movie was so about like the profits and the margins and capitalist extraction and, and to me regenerative at the root of it you know, you think of an agricultural system, an industrial agricultural system that's rooted on stolen land and exploited labor and the plunder of Mother Earth, and regenerative being the opposite of that. It's, it's not the death economy, it's not plunder, it's not extraction. And without, you, without using that wide lens frame, values framework, it's very difficult then to differentiate. Is there a way that you could use cover crops and have it still exploit the land and people? Yes, absolutely. So that's not, you know, that's not the end all be all. Right. Thank you for saying that, yeah. And this, um, you know, regenerative ag, you know, we, we, Michelle pointed out that a lot of our young farmers are really the ones that are sort of innovating and, and really engaging in regenerative ag. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what kind of support are they, they getting right now? Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of the policy aspect? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it's rough 
I would say. Um, I live and work in D.C. Um, and as a member, I'm on an advisory council to the Secretary of Agriculture called the USDA Equity Commission, where we spend a lot of time talking about climate and how to help young farmers specifically. Um, and I think it's difficult um, for me to like have a uh, sort of optimistic outlook on the farm bill at this current moment, to be honest. But I do think that there are things that are happening outside of the federal policy setting system that are really beneficial to young farmers, particularly educating each other on practices that they're working on or practices that they found work for them. Um, regionally, that seems to be something that works really well. Our chapters do a very good job of supporting one another. Um, and I think also what we're noticing is like, as we are dealing with the impacts of climate crisis over time. There are folks who are like in certain parts of the U.S. that might have perfected some practices or land management um, practices in particular that they think are were helpful to them at a time. Now they're helpful to some another part of the country. And so we have um, a marker bill out, which is hopefully maybe one day will be in the farm bill whenever it decides to make itself actual legislation. Um, where it's <laughs> farmers are actually paid to do that work and talk to each other um, about the practices that they're using. And so I'm hopeful that in the long term, and federal policy change is a long game, so, you know, I'm cool with that. But I think in the longer term, farmers would be, like, compensated for educating each other in this way that the federal government just isn't able to right now. The Farmer to Farmer Education Act. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and, and just to that point, actually, I'd be interested in hearing more from, from Leah and Chris about who taught you how to farm and, and innovate in terms of in the face of climate chaos. And can you talk a little bit about, about how that's been handed down to you? And Yeah. Um, I think this idea of the farmer to farmer support is so reflective of our reality um, because... You know, we do have these amazing land grant universities that kind of got a bad rap in the film, um, but a lot of extension agents um, really are here to do the good work with us, and they are very supportive and helpful. And also, um, we are in the best position to be able to help each other through the um, really radical uncertainty around climate. Um, and so, you know, Brenda and I participate in uh, mentorship out of Sullivan County right now, CCE Sullivan, where we got paired up with another beginning farmer who's a little farther in her journey. She's been a solo farmer for eight years and has her own diversified vegetable operation, sells at the Union Square Green Market, and she's been such a lifeline for us this year. We speak at least once a week, and we go through any challenges we're having on the farm, and it doesn't just relate to growing practices. It's also about, you know, how do we keep our business successful, um, how do we deal with challenges we may be facing in some of our market channels? Um, but that that one-on-one -on -one connection with another farmer, knowing that she's getting compensated for our time and so are we, has made all the difference in our first year. So m m very much want to uplift that that is how the knowledge transfer does work and should work, and it should be compensated. Nice. I got to figure out about these compensation channels. But yeah, so I started farming in 1996. I was an apprentice at... Uh, the Food Project in Boston and Lincoln as a teenager, and then worked at, let's see, Farm School Massachusetts as an intern for a year, and then Many Hands Organic Farm for four years, where I worked up to assistant manager, where I was in charge of wholesale accounts and, you know, weeding. <laughs> we like the weeding crew boss. <laughs> um, so that was probably, that's where I got the most extended experience and then ran the community gardens program in Worcester with my then friend, now spouse, and we started the Youth Grow Farm, which was modeled after the food project. Ran that for a couple of years uh, and then did some international farming, um, Ghana, Haiti, Mexico, just learning with indigenous folks about their practices. And wasn't, I would, thought that might be the end. And then when we started Soul Fire, there's, as you know, just so much learning. I mean, I have a mentor now because we were pretty much vegetables and chickens for a while. And now we have goats are newer and um, our orchard is newer. So Seth at East Hollow Cider comes by like four times a season and is like, this is how you need to do your spreaders. And this is what you should do for your, you know, holistic spray and come to these apple round tables with me and... Um, but I want to figure out how to get him compensated. So I, yeah. 
Yeah. It's great. He's just a nice guy. <laughs> I'll let you know when the farmer to farmer okay. yeah, there you shack go. passes. Much needed. He's just a farmer. good neighbor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Leo, in our planning calls, you, you sort of mentioned that you, you had, um, we talked about farmer as innovator and especially in the face of climate chaos. And you mentioned you had a really good story about that. And I was wondering if you could maybe share that. Oh, no, I don't remember which story oh. I told. Give me another clue. Um, I, I think it was in response to a, a major weather event. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is a story from 2012. That was Hurricane Sandy, right? It was 2012, which at the time was the largest hurricane slash tropical storm that hit our region. And I remember, like, the rains and the winds as we went to sleep the night of the storm and being woken in the middle of the night to what sounded like a train or a Mack truck like barreling towards our house and going outside and on the forested hill where there had never been like nary a creek, there was a river just like rushing through the forest towards our farm. And, you know, all of our crops are, <laughs> are about to get washed away. So we have all of our garlic and, you know, tomatoes and just everything that we had grown. So we woke up our children who were younger then and it was like this big there, Nishima, and dug trenches to try to divert as much water as we could, and like muddy and tired, went back to sleep, and we're like, it'll be what it is. Oh, I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> there was no life jackets yet. <laughs> life jackets came later. So um, in the morning, you know, before we went outside, we're like hearing the news, and it turns out like Route 2 and Route 22, which are the only two roads to get to our town, were completely washed out. The farms all around us had lost 50 to 100% of their topsoil, like total crop failures, completely devastating. And when we went outside, there was still water, you know, infiltrating down. And my son put a life jacket on, which he wore for three days because he was afraid of getting washed away. But we didn't lose anything. We didn't lose anything on our farm. And the reason we didn't lose anything is because we we're using Afro-Indigenous regenerative practice, including, you know, rectilinear mounding like the Ovambo people, thick cover crops, perennial strips, um, heavy mulches, contour planting, you know, all of these strategies that increase infiltration and reduce erosion. And, you know, it was, it was a spectacular testament, not only to the fact that these regenerative practices can help us prevent or heal from climate change, but actually mitigate the impacts, you know, the extreme, the storms and the water, but also droughts. And we find often when, when there's extreme summers or extreme winters or mild winters that we have more resilience than a lot of the farms around us, even if they're organic if they're not the ones that aren't using regenerative practices. Yeah. Emmett did not get washed away. Yeah, that's... The, he took the life jacket off, but we have very cute photos of him like <laughs> wearing a life jacket around the yard. <laughs> Whether you're a chef or just love going to restaurants, you know the best ingredients are everything, especially when it comes to beef. In Northern Australia, there's a different approach to raising high-quality beef. West Home, based in Queensland and Northern Territory, is working with the land to create nature-led Australian Wagyu. West Home stewards 16 million acres of rangeland guided by their natural ecosystem. They're led by a belief that if they balance the needs of their cattle with the needs of the environment, both can thrive. West Home's team of rangeland experts and nature managers use a variety of tools to monitor and respond to the welfare of the environment, like satellites that assess grass health and on-the-ground research. Cattle are happier when they have the freedom to forage and explore, so West Home ensures that they can roam wild, foraging at will for the first two to three years of their lives. Their cows graze on native grasses like Mitchell grass, which is only found in Australia, along with dozens of other plants, herbs, and seasonal legumes. The result is a high-quality Wagyu beef that reflects the terroir of Northern Australia and a flavor suited to complement any cuisine. West Home believes that when nature leads, flavor follows. Learn more at westhome.com. Um, and this relationship with the land, we also talked in, in our planning for this about the psycho-spiritual relationship that exists between farmers and the land and treating the land as kin and, and how important that is. And um, we, that was sort of touched on in the film. But, but Chris and Leah, if you want to maybe expand that a little bit and talk a little bit about that, that relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... It's really dependent on scale. Um, and I think this is a point that the film was not able to fully develop about. I think those of us who work at smaller scales are in more positions of intimacy with the land, just because 
we are often more hand scale, um, literally getting hands in soil all the time. Um, and there's a kind of, uh, yeah, intimacy or sort of emotional attachment that can happen in a kind of understanding and a deep listening practice that can arise from that. Um, you know, we go on the land, we do crop walks at least once a week. And part of that is looking for things that are ready to, to harvest. Um, but part of that's also just listening to the land and trying to understand how our actions are impacting the sort of trophic cascade, as Woody Harrelson called it. Um, are, are the birds, do the birds seem to be getting enough to eat? Um, are we seeing the same life cycles of spiders having tons of babies and carrying forward after that um, that'll help control pest pressures? Are we seeing new pests come up? And if so, are the mantises coming to get them so that we won't need to spray anything? Like, it's that kind of noticing and listening that I think um, comes from a lot of different cultures and has been practiced in a lot of different places for a long time that many farmers at the larger scale have lost. Yeah. And seems to me essential for us to figure out how to recapture um, in a way that is taken for granted then and not just like we're not weirdos <laughs> for listening <laughs> like this like that should be standard practice right. um, and was for so many people in the world for so long um, and should be again yeah I think yeah Leah do you want to come on on that too just briefly uh, something they cut out of the interview about Dr. George Washington Carver was uh, when he was asked by his friend Glenn Clark where he got all of the ideas for his thousands of patents. I mean, Dr. Carver was a person who Albert Einstein said is a genius greater than me. Like, incredible scientist. And he said, where I, I got my ideas is that every morning I go out into the forest and the fields before the sun comes up and I listen to the voice of God as God speaks through the plants and the birds and the spiders. Because, quote, Nature is God's unlimited broadcasting system through which God speaks to me every minute, every hour, every day, if I tune into the right channel, which is like, wow, bars. mic drop, like bars, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> just bars. And it's something that I, I think about a lot. And in Afro-Indigenous and Pan-Indigenous traditions, this idea of the divine in nature is universal. And there is a completely different way that we engage with the earth when we understand that the lake is God, that the soil is God, that that spider is God. Uh, desecration, desecration and plunder become impossible through that frame. Um, and it's, I fundamentally believe that there's, there's like no way forward for our civilization without adopting a decolonial frame in regards to our concentricity with all life. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Clap for that. Yes. And as as my the favorite hoodie of my spouse Brenda says, you can't colonize the vibe. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I want to get back to because um, we're we're running we're running short on time, and I really don't want to miss this point on like organizing through food and how important that is, and community organizing and how impactful that can be. And, you know, we're living in this polarized political system, and it can sometimes seem like, what can you do to change and move mm -hmm. past our current system? And Michelle, I'm going to direct this to you in terms of, you know, what are you seeing in terms of what's going on with the Farm Bill now versus how, how impactful community organizing can be through the work that Young Farmers is doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know a second ago I said I, I don't feel super optimistic about some of our marker bills. But I think at the same time, um, I also hope that it, someone heard me also say that I think federal policy change is incremental. I think it takes a, a really long time. Um, I feel really inspired by, like, things that I see happening at county level or state level that the federal government is interested in trying to implement into the farm bill in some way. Um, and so I see I'm, like, very happy about that. Um, and I think one of the things that I didn't love about the film was the description of the Farm Bill. I think it has a lot of power. I think the Farm Bill is not something that should be weaponized. I think it's an opportunity for us to engage with lawmakers directly in a way that a lot of farmers in other countries don't have the opportunity to do, to be honest. I mean, I think it's a, a privilege that we, we can engage with Congress in, in this way. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like sort of excited about that. And I also think that, um, you know, maybe it deserved a little bit of a content warning, but the segment on farmer mental health from the film is like 
very, it's devastating, but also hits close to home. The first chapter of Young Farmers is, was the, actually the Washington State Young Farmer Coalition, uh, WAFC, I think, is the, the like short nickname for it. Um, and those folks actually lost a farmer in a very similar way to the, the film describes. And they organized with each other around that experience. Um, and they passed a bill at the state level. It became a law. And that was used as a pilot. Now in the farm bill, we have $20 million allocated to farmer mental health. Um, programs in the farm bill get passed. They don't always get funded. We don't worry that the farm mental health bill won't get, the farm mental health program won't get funded in the farm bill. It's got unanimous support from Congress. It's implemented wonderfully. Um, the farm mental health grant for the Northeast, it's a regional grant, the way they dole the money out, lives at the Young Farmers Coalition. Um, and so, you know, that's a success. And I think whether that worked out or not, like whether those farmers coming together around a shared experience like that, which was devastating for them, whether that worked out or not, it was healing for them to get together and do something about the fact that they had lost someone. And so, you know, I mean, I think federal policy change might take a really long time. It might take longer than my lifetime, our lifetimes. But I think like legacy matters, you know, and like what you do in your community and how you connect with other people and the things that you leave here, even if it's, you know, you pushed a couple more senators or a couple more people on the House Ag Committee to think about something they never thought about before, someone will pick up the thing that they wrote, the memo that was written, some, that will come back at some point. You know, it might take 10 or 15 years, but eventually it might, it might work. Um, so I think there's power in that. It's just a really, really long game with policy. So it takes patience. Thanks. Go, go. Can I tell a policy success story? Yes, please. <laughs> I mean, success-ish always, but so I remember when Elizabeth Warren was running for president and she put out this like super whack ag platform basically. So a bunch of us wrote an open letter about why it was whack because it didn't include anything about justice or farm workers or black farmers or land or native people or anything. And to her credit, she said, I'd love to meet with you. And it was a group of black farmers who had written this. And so we had a national call and they selected 10 people to meet with her. I was one of those 10 people. We you know, laid out our points. And then she ended up um, adjusting her platform to include these points. That platform then became part of the Justice for Black Farmers Act that was introduced by Cory Booker and her and some other folks. Of course, it was, I guess it's called a marker bill. Like, you don't actually think it's going to get passed, but it sort of like puts it, you know, I got to testify in front of the Ag Committee. It was like crazy. And then that some of that language, specifically the debt reduction um, or debt relief for black farmers got introduced into the Inflation Reduction Act. It was passed, but then there was all these lawsuits. And you'll tell this better than me, Michelle, but you know, essentially they had to like rework it so that it wasn't as black. But it still did result in a whole lot of money going to black farmers in the end, which actually just, just went out, you know, a couple of months ago. So that was a completely unexpected win um, that just started with like speaking up about, you know, to Elizabeth Warren back whenever that was <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Great. That's great. I love to like, I'm going to, I'm going to stop it there because that's a hopeful note to, to go into Q&A with. Um, so let's take um, a couple questions that we had. Absolutely. So there's a model that we use um, when we're doing social justice organizing training at Soul Fire Farm, and it's the model of the butterfly of transformative social justice. If you imag imagine the four wings of the butterfly, they represent the four core strategies of change, which are resist, reform, build, and heal. So to resist is to chain yourself to that pipeline, to that tree, to stop the uranium trucks in their tracks. It's about the direct action that's a hard no. Um, it's uncompromising, it's radical, it's militant. Reform is incremental change, and it refers to public education, um, electoral work, policy work. It's necessary because it matters that millions of dollars go to farmers who otherwise wouldn't be able to continue their farms. It matters today. It matters that there's school lunches tomorrow, right? And part of that is, is reform. BUILD is the creation of these grassroots alternative institutions that model the values that we hope to see in a decolonized world. So it's your farm, it's my farm, it's the freedom school and the homeschool collectives and the you know, community health clinics. And the to heal is there's no way 
under 500 plus years of racial capitalism and colonization that we're not all deeply traumatized, both those who harm and are harmed. And so we need art, we need music, we need therapy, we need um, community circles, we need music and dance, like all of these things we need. A butterfly cannot fly without four, all four wings. So it's absolutely essential that we uplift the policy work that you're doing, the building work that you're doing in your community, the healing work that you're doing as an artist, and to recognize that we can't all each do all of them, but together we make that butterfly fly, right? And so that's, we need to uplift everybody's contribution to the overall picture of how we get free. Thank you for that. Another question that we've gotten is, what do you, where do you see signs of, of hope for the future in food and farming? Am I too cliche if I say young farmers? No. <laughs> no, that's my what I'm honest answer. answer. Yeah. I mean, I think, like, I don't know. I, I, when I work with USDA, which is more often than is probably good for my mental health, to be honest, but when I, when I talk to them, I'm like, you know, it's so much paperwork and like we have to define all these words and then they have to get approved by someone else and then they have to be re It's just like such. A, a, feels like such a waste of time. And then an, a program gets passed and we try to implement it. And then I go visit a farm or I talk to a farmer who benefited from a program in a way that I had never imagined would even be possible. Or they've like received funding for something or somehow, like I just, the way that they, that farm, our, the young farmers in our network structure their proposals to even be eligible for some of this programming, like they're just some of the most innovative folks I've ever encountered. Um, I would love to go back to farming one day. I feel very inspired when I see other young farmers younger than me, older than me, like it doesn't really matter. Um, doing things that I'm just like, when I'm talking to these folks at USDA, you know, feel kind of impossible. I'm like, when will this ever reach a place that it's like actually helpful, you know? Will it take six years? I'm not sure, um, seven, eight. But sometimes I have a moment where I'm like, this worked. And so that's when I feel hopeful when I talk to a farmer and they're like, no, this actually really did help me. And those, that does happen more often than I think we talk about. It's highlighted well, mostly by Evan back there on our, on our comms for work. But um, that's when I, I feel the most inspired and joyful, frankly, is when I'm talking to young farmers. Chris. And I think there's inspiration in young farmers for me. And there's also inspiration in youth who aren't yet farming but want to be. Um, my spouse helped co-found a school in the Bronx and... I was community organizing in northern Manhattan for 10 years. And the amount of young people, young black and brown people mainly, that we came across who have farming in their recent ancestry um, and maybe immigrated to this country to escape some of the pressures of that life that they faced in the Dominican Republic, in Mexico, for instance, um, they want to get back to that work. And they want to reconnect with that work. And there is so much ancestral wisdom that they carry in their bodies and in their spirits. And there's a stigma for them, oftentimes because of their parents having come to this country to have a different life. One of the goals of Seremos, of our farm, is to create a pipeline that gets these kids the opportunity to try it out for a day, a week, a summer, a full season, and to see if that work is healing for them and is what they want to be doing with their lives um, early on so they can make those decisions, so they can make those career path choices and so that we can then demand that these organizations, these nonprofits that exist in the space, connect them up with land, right? I don't need to tell people in this audience or people listening to this podcast that we're in the middle of the largest intergenerational transfer of land this country has ever seen. A lot of it needs to just be given back to the indigenous people and also to the young black and brown farmers would be farmers who stand to be able to start their own farms if we do this right. Yes. Um, and I think it's time is of the essence. And, you know, the, the policy time clock is a challenging one, as Michelle has mentioned. But if we get our act together, we can make this happen. And that gives me some hope. Great. And so then this is... Following uh, on that, on this, this idea of hope, what can we do? To, can you each give us sort of a call of action for, for what, what folks out here can do to help this work? Do you want to go? Fine, we go this way, Leah. <laughs> or in that anyone who holds 
deed to any land, whether that's as an individual or an organization, makes a, makes a succession plan that takes into consideration very strongly um, the indigenous people who are the rightful owners and stewards of that land, as well as uh, dispossessed black and brown communities, and to really think about what it looks like to have uh, a land healing transfer. Um, additionally, there are so many rising generation farmers that are undercapitalized, under-resourced, under-supported. And I recommend checking out the reparations map um, that Soulfire started that is now stewarded by the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust and finding farms in your region or that you know intrigue you and seeing what they need. It might be a web volunteer or a fiscal sponsor or a tractor or you know someone to come volunteer or just money, um, but figuring out how we support those rising generation farmers in taking their next, next step. I think... The goal of re-regionalizing our food economies is also pretty pressing. And I think there are a lot of ways, especially in this region, that people in the Hudson Valley, but all across the country, that people can take advantage of that. Um, and I guess because it's on the brain, because we run a CSA, um, I'm going to say, like, find a community-oriented CSA that allows you the opportunity to connect with other people who are members in that CSA and allows you the opportunity to support your farmer by going out for a work day, um, by getting together with your fellow CSA members and building community. Um, I think we've been thinking a lot this year about the need to put community back into CSA um, because it's a model that can really exist and thrive outside the industrialized food system if people are willing to throw down for community. So. Join Thank a CSA. You. Yes, join a CSA <laughs> if you don't already aren't part of one already. Michelle. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I, I think I said this earlier, the like easiest thing to do with the Young Farmers Coalition is to sign up for our newsletter, join the Farm Bill Action Network. Um, we can help guide you through some of the other things that I think I would say more directly would be helpful. Get to know the folks who make policy decisions where you live at the county level at the state level, at the federal level, um, figure out if ag is a priority or not to them. If it is, they probably have a responsibility to listen to you. If they don't listen to you, complain. Complain, escalate your complaint. Keep escalating your complaint. Um, especially folks who, um, excuse me, especially folks who identify with like the realities that USDA technical extension offices are not super helpful, right? Like that's just a reality, they know that. They're very aware of it, they've admitted it. Um, right now we have folks in power at USDA who care more about what they call customer satisfaction, which is whether or not they're actually helpful to farmers than maybe ever before. There are more people of color that work at USDA and USDA leadership than ever before. That will not always be the case. Um, we don't know what the future holds. We have an election coming up. It's just, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, um, especially in the executive branch. So while you do have people in USDA who are actively trying, whether you feel that way or not, whether it feels like they're trying or not, um, this isn't a moment, a window that you have actually to be heard by USDA. So I would say just keep escalating your complaint until somebody responds. And if they don't, you can send me an email. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> you're gonna get a lot of emails. <laughs> all right, that's our time. Thank you so much, panelists. So inspiring to hear. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Churchtown Dairy, Young Farmers Heritage Radio. Um, I know Jonna has some announcements about raffles, maybe. And you want me to do it? Okay. All right. So I'm gonna call it. We got a lot of raffles. Hey listeners, thank you so much for listening to HRN. We want to make your experience as a listener even better, and to help us do that, we'd love your input on our audience survey. It'll only take a few minutes, and by completing it, you can enter to win a $250 gift card from Goldbelly. Visit heritageradionetwork.org survey to take the survey and to help us keep growing and improving. That's heritageradionetwork.org survey. Thanks for your support.